Hey everyone, Tin Man here with a beginner's guide to the strategy of teamfight tactics, the newest game mode in League of Legends. This guide is aimed at beginners who have little prior experience with auto chess games and will introduce you to the broad strategy ideas and concepts that can help you to improve at teamfight tactics. I will not be going into specifics about what is good or bad in the current meta because that changes every week or two with balance patches. This is meant as an overview of these concepts, however I will be making more detailed videos on each of these topics and many others, so look for those coming soon. I want to start by discussing items. Unlike many of the other auto battler or auto chess games out there, the strategy in teamfight tactics is heavily focused on their item system. First I'll quickly review how that item system works and then discuss how it should influence your strategy. You have two ways to get items, from the neutral creep rounds three rounds at the start of the game, and then once again at the end of every stage. And then each unit you pick from the shared draft, also called the carousel, will also have an item equipped. These items will most often be components, which offer a small stat boost, like plus 20 damage for a BF sword. All of them that is, except for the spatula, which offers no stats on its own, but when it combines, it grants the same stats of whatever it combined with. Speaking of combinations, every component in the game can combine with every other component to create a completed item. Currently, there are 8 different components in the game, which can combine into a total of 36 completed items. These completed items retain the stat bonuses from their components, but also add an additional effect. To combine two components, simply drag and drop them onto the same unit. All of these items are summarized in a chart like this one. This in one in particular is a little bit out of date in terms of the effects of the completed items, but there are plenty of similar charts out there to help you quickly reference what items combine with which and what they do. This is actually a lot to learn for a newer player, so I would highly recommend keeping a chart like this open on a second monitor or some other easy place to reference so that you can know what your item options are. Each of your units can hold at most three items. Components and completed items both count as a single item for this purpose. Once an item is equipped to a unit, it cannot be removed unless you sell the unit, and once any two completing components are combined into a completed item, they cannot be disassembled. These completed items are a major power increase for your units, but once you equip and combine them, you cannot easily go back if you change your mind later. That leads to two different schools of thought on item strategy. The first is to simply combine items as soon as possible, into whatever items you can make. You may end up with some weird items on some 1 star units, but this will lead to a strong power spike early in the game, and possibly set you on a nice early win streak. Those wins can mean more gold and a higher life total into the mid and late game, which hopefully you can use to overcome some less than ideal items at that point. Now this is risky of course, since most of your opponents are also trying to win, and so going on a win streak is far from assured. The other strategy option is to amass your item components for a while and wait until after a few carousels or creep rounds to really make any decisions on what to combine. By holding onto these four components, for instance, we'll have, we have six different possible items to choose from. This will give you more options and potentially combinations that are better suited for your composition. But it does come at the cost of being weaker in that early game, and if you start to lose too much life, it can be difficult to recover even with good items. So which is correct? Well, it depends on your situation. If you have a strong early game, maybe you found a few upgraded units early on, and you think you'll be able to get a win streak, in that case, combining items early can really ensure that win streak and propel you to a strong early game. But if you do not have much luck and you can't combine units in the opening rounds, it might be best to just wait and accept a few losses and keep your options open, because a combined item might not make the difference if you're otherwise very weak. In either case, you should think of the shared draft rounds as a chance to pick a specific item that you want, rather than pick a specific unit that you want. You can find units by spending gold at any time, but you have no control over which items you get from the limited creep rounds, so unless you really need a specific unit to upgrade right away, it's generally better to think of this as picking an item more than picking a unit. But how do you know which items to look for and combine? Well, that will depend on your composition. Your composition is the group of units that you use, along with the synergies that you can activate to improve them. Since synergies are activated by reaching certain thresholds of similar units, your composition by the late game will tend to focus on just a couple of major synergies while ignoring other options. Most compositions will consist of two parts, a frontline and a backline. The frontline is the tanky units, with high health and armor. 
Synergies like Knights, Guardians, Brawler, and Yordle give your units additional defensive capabilities and make great frontliners. Some items can also help your frontline out, like Chainmail and Giant's Belt, along with the completed items that they make. These units are mainly there to hold the enemy in place and absorb damage to keep your backline alive. The backline consists of the main damage dealers. Certain synergies like Ranger, Gunslinger, and Sorcerer increase your damage output, while items like BF Sword, Needlessly Large Rod, and Recurve Bow will often go on these backliners. These units are generally more vulnerable, with less health than armor, so they need the frontline to protect them while they dish out the damage. Some units do not really fit nicely into this dichotomy, like Demons, which are both offensive and defensive, and Shapeshifters, who can tank a lot of damage, while also dealing quite a bit while transformed. Regardless, it's helpful to think of your composition broadly in these terms, because some synergies simply do not fit well together. For example, if your composition is using both Guardians and Yordles, then both frontline synergies, and you do not have very many backline units or synergies, you can survive quite a while in the fight, but you'll probably not actually kill opposing units and you'll eventually lose. Similarly, if you have Rangers who excel at auto attacks, it probably does not make much sense to pair them with sorcerers who focus on ability damage. That pairing also leaves you with a complete lack of frontliners, so your weak damage dealing units will get killed off very quickly. You want to look for units and synergies that pair naturally well together, that provide some tanks and some damage dealers. Guardians and rangers are a good combination, yordles and sorcerers are good, but guardians and yordles bad and rangers and sorcerers also pretty bad. There's one other type of backline, a hyper carry, and this often goes hand in hand with other synergies, but units like Volibear, Shivana, Draven, Rengar, and several others are particularly popular for this hyper carry type of build. These builds are focused on protecting and enabling your single carry unit as much as possible, and this often means using the full three completed items on that unit, as well as tailoring the rest of your units with this single carry in mind to complete the synergies that you need to enable them. Something like Shivana really wants Dragon and Shapeshifter synergy, while Draven really needs Imperial and Blademaster to really maximize his damage. Regardless of what type of build you're going for, you want to focus on being efficient about it. And by that I mean you should choose units that always have a purpose in your build, and you should try to activate as many synergies as possible. Take this example, where I had a particularly efficient composition. Off on the left, we can see at 8 units, I had completed Phantom, 4 Knight, 3 Noble, 3 Blade Master, 2 Imperial, and 1 Ninja. Notice how it, we are at exactly the correct thresholds for these synergies. Exactly 4 Knights, and exactly 3 Blade Masters, etc. Any more than those numbers, and that's essentially a wasted unit. They do not contribute to gaining that bonus, and could be swapped out for something that would complete another synergy. I also have very minimal incomplete synergies, with only a single Ranger tag wasted. Now this is a rather extreme example, and often at times in the late game, the pure strength of a unit will outweigh other synergies. So in this example, I actually replaced the Fiora with the Yasuo to keep the Blade Master buff, although it would lose the, two, the 3 Noble buff. But Yasuo is just a much better unit than Fiora on its own in the late game. But in general, you should aim for compositions that maximize completed synergies and minimize the incomplete ones. Compare that to this intentionally bad composition. In this one we have three gunslingers, which is one away from the four bonus, and one ninja, but no other synergies are active. And we have a ton of unused traits, two of three blade masters, and then one each of Yordle, Pirate, Wild, Brawler, Noble, Dragon, and Sorcerer. It's a complete mess, and it's very inefficient. We are missing out on so many synergies by having all these wasted traits, and we are weaker as a result. To create this efficiency, you should be looking at what synergies you are close to activating and planning your next unit or looking to swap units to complete them. If you have two of three Blade Masters, as in this bad example, you might look to add another Blade Master as your next unit, preferably one that also has a trait you're looking for as well. It may it makes sense to look for some it makes less sense, rather, to look for something like Yordles, which you are two away from. Adding another one does not complete that synergy, and every unit that you add after the first four or five units really should be completing an additional synergy. Otherwise, you end up being very inefficient and getting yourself into a situation like this. You want to take advantage of as many synergies as possible, and to do that, you can look for overlap between units. 
take this example of knights and rangers. Since Mordekaiser and Kindred share a phantom trait, and Garen and Vane share the noble trait, we have the frontline knights, the backline rangers, and with their overlap, we also have some secondary synergies like nobles and phantoms to pair with it. It makes a lot of sense to use these four units as the core of a composition. If you look for combinations and overlap like this while building your teams, you can maximize the number of alliances and synergies that you make, and then minimize the unused traits. All of this ties back into items. The types of units you pick and the types of items that you combine should synergize. If you're using gunslingers or rangers who make many auto attacks, then on hit effects like cursed blade or sword breaker are very effective. If you're using sorcerers or other ability reliant units, then items like Morella Nomicon or Seraph's Embrace help to empower those. If you're looking for a hyper carry type strategy, rapid fire cannon can give them additional attack range and make their attacks always hit, while defensive items like Phantom Dancer and Dragon Tooths can help them to survive, which is important since you're kind of putting all of your eggs in one basket. Now, knowing what goes into a composition is nice, but if you don't have the gold, then it's going to be really hard to find the proper units and level them up. So what's the strategy behind gold management? You gain gold in a number of ways. Passively, you gain 5 gold per round, plus additional gold for winning a round, along with wins and loss streaks, and then finally interest. For every 10 gold that you have at the start of the round, you will earn an additional gold in the form of interest. For example, if you have between 20 and 29 gold, you'll earn 2 extra gold on the round, but if you get to 30, then you gain 3 bonus gold. This goes to a maximum of 5 extra for 50 gold saved. This means that the way to optimize your gold income relies on establishing either a winning or losing streak to gain the bonus, and then to save up to 50 gold for interest. Of course, this is not always feasible. If you're trying to fully maximize your gold income, then you will not be spending very much early on, which will make you very weak in the early game, which could lead to you taking a lot of damage. Instead, you need to strike the right balance, spending enough to avoid taking too much damage while also saving for interest. Now, this is not trivial, but I'm going to give you some quick tips here to help properly manage your gold. The biggest mistake newer players make is refreshing or re-rolling the shop too much early on. This wastes two gold with no guarantee of finding an upgrade. That two gold could be used to buy experience or level up or even saved for interest. In the early game especially, you will get a much more consistent increase in power by leveling up rather than re-rolling. You will have better units in your shop by leveling up, and of course you get to put an additional unit in. In general, you should be looking to get to at least level 6 before rerolling. Some more extreme strategies rely on rerolling before that, but as a newer player, waiting to reroll is probably better. Most compositions will want to get to level 7 or even level 8 though, so do not completely waste all of your gold on rerolling re as soon as you hit level 6. Another important note is optimal timing to spend your gold. Since you gain 2 experience per turn naturally, and you can only purchase it in chunks of 4 experience, that means it is only optimal to level up every other turn. For instance, in this top situation, we have 20 of 46 experience, and that means we are 26 away, but it will cost 28 gold to level up, since 26 is not a multiple of 4. If we wait one more turn, we'll get to 22 of 26, meaning that it will only cost 24 gold to level up. Compare that to the bottom situation, where we are already 24 XP away from leveling up, it'll cost us exactly 24 gold this turn. This is a more optimal timing. Now it's not disastrous to level up inefficiently, but if you can wait another round, you essentially get to save 4 gold by waiting to level up. And if you're high enough on life total, that is typically going to be best. The other time to spend gold is after creep rounds or after carousel or shared draft rounds. These represent large power spikes for most players, as they will get new item components and new units to improve their lineup. If you do not find some upgrades or newly equipped items on your own after these rounds, you're probably much weaker than you think you are, and will likely lose in the next few rounds. You can anticipate this though and preemptively spend your gold either leveling up or rerolling. That also leads into the last point. It's much better to spend your gold early before you lose rounds and lose lots of health. In the late game, that is. 
That will come with experience to know exactly how strong you are and how likely you are to win the next round, but the damage taken when you lose gets very high later on, so it's better to be safe than sorry. The last topic I want to discuss is positioning. I think this is a much less important topic for newer players to understand, certainly compared to the previous topics. In most cases, if you simply put melee units or other tanky units up front and the squishier, higher damage dealer ranged units in back, you'll do fine. But here, there are a couple other things to keep in mind when positioning your units. First one, don't lock melee units in. In this example, my Shivana right here is completely surrounded. This might be effective if you're up against some assassins who you know will jump behind you, but if not, Shivana might not get into melee range, then she'll just stand there doing nothing while the rest of your front line gets torn apart, only entering the battle once you've already lost. In this next example, which is actually the same build but from earlier in the game, I left a little escape path for her right here, off to the right, and this is a path where she can walk into combat. This position will help prevent her from being an immediate target of most of the opponent's attacks, but still let her get into combat safely, even if a little bit delayed. This example also illustrates another good tip. Units in the corner or the furthest back are often the most vulnerable to units like Blitzcrank or Assassins. Here I'm using a level 1 Lulu, just for the Sorcerer's Synergy. At level 1 she won't do too much, so I put her in the corner so that if the opponent has an Assassin or Blitzcrank who hooks the furthest target, it will hit my lower value target like the Lulu here rather than my higher value Shivana right away. You do not get put a higher damage dealing unit with several items to get burst down right at the start of the fight if you put them in the corner like that. The last positioning tip is that the units on the edge of the formation are more exposed than those who have units on both sides of them. Staying with this, this example, we see that our main tank here, Rek'Sai, is in the most exposed position, while our secondary carry, Kassadin, who has several items on him, is in the middle. The only units who will initially target Kassadin are those who are directly in front of him, while everyone to the right here will try to target Rek'Sai, and anyone stacked up in the corner will probably target Morgana. This relates to a concept called zones of control that determines which units target which other units in combat. That's a very high level overview of some of the main strategy considerations in Teamfight Tactics. As I mentioned before, I'll be doing separate, more in-depth videos on each of these topics, as well as plenty of other strategy, gameplay, and meta report videos. Make sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up to date with all of them. This video is made possible in part thanks to my amazing Patreon subscribers. If you like this type of content and want to see more of it, please do consider supporting me over there, and let me know what types of content and benefits you'd like to see. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.